Hello and welcome back to part two on my WebSocket series. Today I will build a WebSocket server on AWS. Components I will be needing for that are the API Gateway, Lambda, DynamoDB and Cognito. When we look at the Amazon console, it looks like the WebSocket API is just like REST API or HTTP API. Just instead of clicking left, click on the right. Unfortunately, that's not at all the case. As you see, we need to define routes, predefined and custom routes to set up the API. So let's look into what we need to do to make this work. Just like in a REST API, we want to expose Lambda functions to the internet. However, it's very different. We have a multitude of connections open at the same time and we receive messages over these connections. The connections are identified by a connection ID and it's up to us and the configuration to manage these connections. The API gateway does a technical connection management, but we need to make sure the logical connection management is implemented. The routes we need to define specify to which Lambda function an incoming message is routed on a given connection. There are special routes, connect and disconnect, where we open and close connections. Every message that comes in has a connection ID specified. However, we need to make sure we know what to do with that connection ID because these connections are opened up and closed all the time and we need to know what is the context of these? Who is the user who opened these connections? And also we need to make sure that not everyone opens connections as they want. So we need to make sure only authorized users open these connections. The steps to open a connection are on the client side. The client needs to get an authorization token from Cognito, which is the same as what he would use to open a REST API. Then he connects to the WebSocket API and hands over that authorization token. The WebSocket API will call the specified connect Lambda function. And this is a function we need to implement to make a decision whether we accept this connection and also to register that connection in our connection repository. We also need to specify a disconnect function that basically cleans up our connection repository when the connection closes. So the connect function needs to take that authorization token and use it to make a decision whether we allow that connection and also identify who's the user behind that authorization token. For the REST API, the API gateway provides a Cognito authorizer and a Lambda authorizer. Unfortunately for the WebSocket API, Amazon provides only a Lambda authorizer and no Cognito authorizer. So we need to be a bit creative and either implement that ourselves or find some other way to verify the authorization token. The way I handled that was that I call in my connect function, a REST API, which is protected by an Cognito authorizer and returns me the information on the user. Then we need to implement a connection repository that allows us to look up for each incoming message by the connection ID, who is the user behind that, or for outbound traffic, which connection can be used to reach the, the user we want to reach. And also an outbox if for the user we want to send a message to, there is no connection currently. So the user is not connected at the moment. So we can store that message in the outbox and deliver it whenever the user logs in again. For these lookups, I'm using DynamoDB, but technically the use case is perfect for an in-memory database. The size of the data is not too large. It's a very simple lookup. And if you have an application that has enough volume and high low latency requirements, feel free to move it from DynamoDB to an in-memory database. The way it works will be completely the same. So I have two tables, one where I store for each connection ID, the user ID, and one where I store for the user ID, the connection ID. Upon disconnect, 
are removed from both tables these connections. Now having said that, with this structure, if one user logs in with multiple devices, the connection will be overwritten. So if you want to facilitate having multiple sessions for one user, you need to allow multiple connections for one user and send a message, an outbound message, to multiple connections if the user has multiple connections. In general, the setup consists of three parts. One is managing the connections. One is accepting messages from the client and handing them on to the Lambda function. And the third part is sending outbound messages from a Lambda function to the client. Let's start with the connection management. I have set up two tables in DynamoDB, one where I map the user to the connection and one where I map the connection to the user. So the partition key, which I will use to look up an entry, is the connection ID on one and the user ID on the other. Here's my Lambda function that opens a connection. So first of all, I read the connection ID that is given in the request context from the API gateway. I read the authorization token that is given in the header of the message. And then I make a HTTPS call to a different REST API where I send that authorization token and get a response of the user ID. Then I process the response and get the user ID. So at this point, I know the user is authorized. His token is valid. I know the user ID and of course I have the connection ID. So I register the connection in two tables, the connection user and the user connection, basically the same information just to facilitate lookups in both directions in a highly performant way. Then I do one put for each of these tables and wait for the response. That way these puts are done in parallel. Then it's very important to always return the status code 200 if you don't return the status code 200, the connection is not opened. That's all we have to do to open a connection. Of course, if you want, you can also verify the API key. The close connection function is the opposite. It just removes the entries from the repository. So I get the connection ID from the request context. First, I have to look up the user ID that is registered for this connection that I do here. Once I have user ID and connection ID, I can remove the entry from both tables. And again, I return status code 200. So let's look at the configuration of the API gateway. So under routes, I have a couple of default routes, connect, disconnect. This is where I specify which Lambda function will be called. So here we see open connection and discon and close connection on disconnect. There's a default if no other route is specified. I have now specified one example, RVSP. So if in request body action, we find the string RVSP, it calls this Lambda function. Otherwise, it will be routed to the default Lambda function. Now under authorizers, there's no option to use a Cognito authorizer. So I'm not using this at all. You can also use a Lambda function to authorize the calls and dissect the authentication token yourself. Models is optional where you can specify the structure of the messages transfer. And deployment stages give you the production URLs. So unlike a REST API, you have two URLs. One, the WebSocket URL is what the clients outside will call. So here you specify the WSS and then the URL. The connection URL is what you use on your Lambda functions when you send a message to the client. So this one you use in your Lambda functions and at the end you append the connection ID. Then you can use the post function and transfer information to the clients. Important to note that every Lambda function that sends messages to clients using this gateway 
needs to have a special IAM authorization role. Let's have a quick look how that looks in action. So here I have my two lookup tables, connection user and user connection. You see the item count is zero on both of them, so I have no active connections. I will now start a client to open a connection. I'm starting a mobile app on my simulated iPhone and as soon as the app starts up, it will connect to this gateway. So the connection is open and now let's look into the tables. Now we have a table item here and it maps the connection ID and the user ID. And same in the other table, we have a user ID, have a user ID and the connection. So in each direction we can look up the connection. Now I close the connection again just by stopping the app and the items are removed from the database. Now let's look into the handling of inbound messages. So if under request body action, we see the attribute RVSP, it will be mapped into this flow under this route. I'm routing it straight to a Lambda function. Compared to a REST API, things are slightly different. So first of all, we only get the connection ID in a request context. And then I need to use the lookup table and get the user ID from that table. Then under event body, I get the data that is transferred to the client. So you see the environment is slightly different under WebSocket API and in REST API. So you get the content from different environment variables and also the encoding might be different. Then I can use my business functionality as in any other Lambda function. I need to finish the execution of the Lambda function with return status code 200, which is important to keep the connection alive. I cannot use the return statement to return data to the client. To return data to the client, you use the add connections API so here you see the ID of your API, the region, the stage, and then add connections. On that you append the connection ID that you will be addressing. You use the post function and you specify an action and some content that you will be sending and you post that over to the client. And then you complete your Lambda function. So these are all the parts you need to configure in AWS to set up the complete WebSocket API in the cloud. In my next video, I will show how to implement the client side on a Flutter mobile application. So if you're interested in that, please subscribe to my channel. If this video was helpful to you, please like and leave a comment below.